Vice Chancellor. The Honourable Deputy Vice Chancellor. The Honourable Deans and Directors. The Honourable Professors. The Associate Professors, Lecturers, and Students. Fellow dignitaries, respected audience, good morning to you all. Thank you so much for your very kind introductions. And let me assure you that the name is long and difficult, also in Dutch. <laughs> and I note that maybe Oriental globalization has taken on a different meaning at ICMAS. I get to understand that the weekend has also taken on a different meaning. <laughs> Um, <coughs> the leading question is, in Northeast Asia, per capita GDP is high, inequality is low, relatively. In Southeast Asia, per capita GDP is low, inequality is high. Is this just a time lag, or is there a pattern of differences? between North East and South East Asia. This is the leading question. Why should we be looking at this question in 2014? South East Asia has recovered from the Asian crisis of 1998 with above average growth rates. However, growth, as we all know, is too slim a yardstick. Um, it's also known as the gross domestic problem, and in China they call it GDPism. What matters is the quality of growth or development in broad sense. Second, miracles don't last. The German miracle, the Japanese miracle, thereafter South Korea, Taiwan, yet all of them have achieved a higher level of development. I think we should compare Northeast and Southeast Asia for the following reasons. In the 21st century, emerging economies are leading the world economy. We are no longer looking north to Europe or the United States. We are looking south. We are looking um, at emerging economies and ask, what is emerging? What is the quality of growth in emerging economies? The emerging economies include the BRICS, Mexico, Turkey, Argentina, many others, but Asia leads. East Asia in particular. Does this include Southeast Asia? And on what terms does it include Southeast Asia? What is behind the label? What is the quality of growth in Southeast Asia? Having led the world economy for 18 out of 20 past centuries, Asia is back in the driver's seat. Again, what about Southeast Asia? In this setting, of course, the question resumes Mahathir's Look East 1981 outlook. In 2014, we find that Japan has, replaced, has been replaced by China. So we must also consider China. Can tiger cubs become tigers? South Korea and Taiwan are no longer developing countries. They are developed. They are not even emerging economies. They have emerged. They are members of OECD, or in the case of Taiwan, um, with observer status. They are rated investment grade in international finance. Now, if this is a general question, these are some of the reasons why this is important, but how should this question be addressed? Um, I think points to take into account are to, to avoid presentism and to take into account the depths of the historical field, also in order to capture the transformations in the longer durée. Um, also because the problematic itself 
involves temporal dynamics. Next, avoid one dimensionality and apply, as much as possible, without being as a multi multidimensional approach. Avoid economism and culturalism. In the past, several perspectives from Southeast Asia have been culturalists, such as Lee Kuan Yew's Confucian ethic, others with Asian values, Mahathir with Nalayu. Um, an emphasis on institutions may be strategic because it combines different elements in it, in, by its character. Next, avoid inbuilt ideology. To avoid that an approach is a comparison is biased in itself by fixed assumptions, for example, fixed assumptions about capitalism, democracy, and so forth. It is strategic to adopt a comparative capitalism approach, and I will discuss that later. We should apply, I think, paradigm consciousness, and this perhaps is a continental European element. Um, perhaps this, these criteria are a little ambitious. And I have been driving for the past two and a half months a proto Tardana car using GPS. And the GPS, when I miss a turn again, or this construction tells me recalculating. <laughs> and I detect a note of reproach in this. Maybe it's sarcasm, maybe it's weariness. But I ignore it and I recalculate and I move on. Also, in this research, after I miss a turn, take a wrong turn, I have to recalculate. And surely, as we carry on in the second phase of this research, <coughs> I will do that again. And I think also countries must keep calm and recalculate from time to time. A note on Oriental globalization. Just some quick points. Um, we could uh, refer to the resumption of the caravan trade around 500 common era. The Silk Roads, the Maritime Silk Roads, of course, are familiar. So are the spice routes. Um, and Asia leads in this configuration, as mentioned before, during 18th and 20th, 20th centuries, and particularly in the period 1100 to 1800. And as the subcontinent and China were labor forces, so too was Southeast Asia. As a midpoint, the center of maritime commerce and in the spice trade. I quote Janet Abdelmugat, Venice survived because Egypt survived, sustained by the persistence of the southern route to Asia. And there is the, the familiar quote, the famous quote of the 16th century Portuguese writer, Tomé Pires, whoever is Lord of Malacca has his hands on the throne of Venice. <coughs> so, Malacca, Southeast Asia, is central to the transformations of the long 16th century. And if this is familiar to all of you, it is yet important to highlight it. Because in the wider discussion of globalization, say, in world system theory, and I spent three years with Emmanuel Wallerstein, Wallerstein emphasizes the low countries <coughs> my neighborhood, and the Baltic trade as central to the formation of the modern world system in the long 16th century. And I think he is wrong. Um, here is a quote by Anthony Reid about developments in Southeast Asia. 
after 1400, whole communities devoted themselves to cultivating sparse cash crops. The boom in Southeast Asia's trade peaked in 1580-1630. Exceptional demands from China, Japan, India, and Europe. Look at how central the region is. These high price levels throughout the world. And silver from the Americas. And, and Japan also enters into this picture. So this is a region in which the Atlantic and the Pacific exchanges come together. What was the motivation of the Portuguese in annexing Malacca? There's a wonderful quote that I owe the reference to Helen Ting. Um, if they were only to take Malacca out of the hands of the Moors, and the Moors here means Muslims, Cairo and Mecca would soon be entirely ruined, and Venice would then be able to obtain no spices except what her merchants might buy in Portugal. Lisbon did succeed in this ambition. They did monopolize for Europe the spice uh, trade, but there was just one hitch. They expelled the Jews in 1492, in the same year that they sent Fernand and Isabel sent Columbus to, to the Americas. And the Jews then went from, from Lisbon to Antwerp and took the spice trade with them. And then to Amsterdam, the Sephardic Jews, this is how Spinoza ends up in Amsterdam, and to Bologna and to Istanbul and started cooperating with the Turks. Um, in other words, uh, the spice trade in Southeast Asia is wired up, is connected to many other types of dynamics. Um, Occidental globalization takes a lead from approximately 18, 1800, leads until approximately 2000, of course, the years are uh, under consideration, are being recalculated uh, as we speak. Um, Asia's role as driver of the world economy gradually makes a comeback. Um, key moments are the Meiji restoration in Japan in 68, victory of uh, Russia in the war, um, the Bandung Conference, establishment of ASEAN, the Asian Tigers, the rise of Southeast Asian economies, and then we get the Pacific century, the Asian century, ideas that were cut short by the Asian economy. Now, the categories that we use, categories like like Southeast Asia, are of course contingent categories. Um, um, these regions are layers of many cosmopolitanisms, pre colonial cosmopolitanism, a colonial one, a post colonial one, um, commerce and diasporas, various forms of regionalism, state regionalism. <coughs> market leaderism and so forth. Actually, if we talk about the medical age, consider in Northeast Asia, two of them are city-states, Hong Kong and Singapore. They're not countries. They don't have a rural hinterland. So we can put them aside. In Northeast Asia, we can focus actually on South Korea and, um, and Taiwan. And of course, also Japan belongs in another category because we present an earlier industrial wave. In Southeast Asia, we focus on the middle tier countries, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and the third tier countries, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, belong uh, in the different categories. And in the middle tier countries, we can probably focus, for many purposes, on Malaysia and Thailand as the most advanced industrial countries. Um, 
let us do a rather than sweeping, generalizing comparisons, let's do a sectoral comparison of trends in North East, South East Asia, look at agriculture, industry services, and after that, let's look at state institutions. After that, let's put this in the context of capitalism and conclude with notes on the role of China. key point to note, and in parentheses, I will not give you the numbers in on these slides in order to avoid that you will be inflicted by temporary blindness. Uh, the numbers, the tables, are in the printed version of this talk, which you will receive right after. Um, <coughs> Part of the numbers are, the, that is striking, the Gini coefficients in North East, South East Asia. Those of North East Asia approximate, are in the neighborhood of, the Gini coefficients of North Western Europe, Scandinavia, Germany, Netherlands, and so forth, which are in the mid to high 20s. Those in North East Asia are the low circuits. Those in South East Asia are much higher uh, in, the, um, in a different league. Another element is uh, this. There is also a table in the printed version that compares South East Asia middle tier with South East Asia third tier countries. And of course, then, the middle tier countries come out looking good. This is the soft comparison. The comparison with Northeast Asia is the tough comparison. Start with agriculture. The key point is that Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan all underwent post war um, land reform. Uh, which boosted agricultural productivity, was accompanied by broad educational reform, progressive fiscal, fiscal policies, and these instilled in these societies fundamental egalitarian elements which explain even now the Gini coefficients. However, in Southeast Asia, we do not see this happening. There are reforms that are much less egalitarian. They take place in an unreformed agrarian structure. And the distribution of land and incomes is far more skewed. The labor intensity of agricultural production is lower. And there is no country that has pursued an integrated rural development policy. Um, The pattern is that in Southeast Asia we see large land holdings, low agricultural productivity, because the rule is always the larger the land holding, the lower the productivity. We see aristocratic strata or their equivalents that continue to influence local and national politics. Take a country like Thailand, about 90% of privately owned land is owned by just 10% of the population. In contrast, former socialist countries, Vietnam, China, have experienced major land redistribution, practice intensive agriculture, and have higher agricultural productivity. So there is a pattern here. The pattern is, in Northeast Asia, intensive agriculture with high productivity per hectare, Double the yield of most of Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia, large land holdings, extensive agriculture plantations of swimming cultivation, and lower productivity per hectare. The exception in parentheses in Southeast Asia is Java, Java also Bali, where high population density has long given rise to a more um, intensive form 
of, of good, good pressure. We turn to industry. Um, Japan and South Korea invested in heavy industry following the German model, which in Japan included a military industry and a navy. Investment in heavy industry meant long-term state investment and support. Um, in short, the developmental state. Industrial policy fostered competition among enterprises and weeding out losers, not simply picking winners. Export discipline in which government subsidies were directly tied to exports monitored at the harbors. And financial prudence. Then the countries applied <coughs> critical copying, reverse engineering, and over time, technological <coughs> upgrading, and indigenous innovation, which, as we all know, has generated international brands, Samsung, LG, Hyundai, Acer, Acer. Um, <coughs> which all involve, this is an Acer com computer, I now notice that is also an Acer computer, um, major and growing investments in research and development. In Southeast Asia, in contrast, assembly industries that are part of global value networks predominate alongside like domestic industries, the Singapore model of industrial development led by foreign direct investment shapes trends in the region. Why did Singapore opt for this model? Because of its small size. And it combined this model with uh, a capable and a capacious state that integrated it with policies of skills and development and tech transfer. In Malaysia, Researchers note one of the reasons to adopt the FDI model was to avoid relying on Chinese capital. In Thailand, a key reason <coughs> to adopt this model was a general approach of laissez-faire economic policy. In Indonesia and the Philippines, American influence played a major role. Cold War context and so forth. Um, in Malaysia, FBI has been concentrated in the electronic sector, and now if we move the plot forward 40 years, observers find that Malaysia's industrialization has stalled. Um, rather than moving up the ladder of productivity, upgrading the industry remains locked. The industry meant what in a low skill, low value added activities, which is reinforced by importing on a large scale migrant, migrant workers. Quote, rather than seeing a desired increase in the demand for technical and engineering personnel, the Malaysian electronics industry has become increasingly dependent on the import of lower skill migrant workers. Um, High-tech exports are a sizable part of Malaysia's and Thailand's manufactured ex exports in the order of 60% and um, 31%. Yet their R&D expenditures are, are minute, are tiny. So uh, economists find, um, after 35 years of specializing in electronics, Malaysia is by and large no further than low value added assembly industry. Even in Penang's most advanced electronics in industry and recent research by Malaysian economist Jessica Kony Prabhasitam um, confirmed this and noted an ongoing decline in the country's exports of parts and components. Malaysia has also invested in heavy industry, iron, steel and automobiles but state support was crisscrossed by ethnic and party political considerations. Likewise, in Thailand, space specialization and the automobile industry has not paid off. And Thailand has been locked 
in a middle income trap for more than 20 years. And now faces a challenge in sustaining growth and continuing to benefit from um, globalization. A predecessor as Moravia Chair, Cuneo, the Japanese scholar who mentioned earlier, made the diagnosis of Southeast Asian industry as technologyless industrialization. Uh, which now assumes a more crucial character because the China effect enters into the picture, increasing competition from China. Um, say Thailand increased demand from China has been a positive factor in recent years, but already China's market is racing ahead with consumers developing more sophisticated consumption patterns, Thailand may not be able to supply the increasingly sophisticated markets in China because Thailand is facing a middle income trap, a situation where its technological development is too low to develop new uh, products and move up the value chains. In Southeast Asia, for political reasons, state policies often fostered costly innovation monopolies rather than competition and did not apply export discipline. Experiments like aerospace, an expensive failure, and automobiles in Indonesia have foundered, a near exception, Malaysia's Proton Saga survives thanks to a joint venture with Mitsubishi and is sold only in the Indian countries. Um, <coughs> so look closely then at the cityscapes, compare the cityscapes in Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, what do we actually see? There is a difference. They look the same in so many respects with their corporate high rises and traffic jams and mobile Wi-Fi populous and rich as evolves, but if you look closely, there is a difference. In Southeast Asia, the cities, in the cities, the salient corporate logos are of international brands and international banks, rather than of national industries. Look at the skyline of that of Seoul, and over the city tower, the neon logos of Samsung, SK, LG, Hyundai. <coughs> so while both Northeast Asia and mid-tier Southeast Asia are factory economies, they are different kinds of factory economies. In one case, national ownership and high tech. In the other case, foreign ownership and low tech. Uh, industrial export economies often practice wage repression to keep uh, to, to keep their exports competitive. This is the case in Germany, China, Japan, also in Southeast uh, Asia. Um, say in Malaysia, the share of wages as GDP is a low 32 percent. Also in Thailand. Um, there is a low wage policy approach. And this is matched by methods of labor control in the factories with dormitories and curfews and so forth. This situation in Southeast Asian industry generates a twofold problem. First, industrial. <coughs> Industrial production has become more competitive, less profitable worldwide. With accelerated globalization, industrial sector has become increasingly dynamic with tight margins. So the era of industrial export-led growth is coming to a close. China's competition in manufacturers adds to the pressure. Second. Southeast Asia's low wage model limits domestic demand, limits the domestic market, 
which is counterproductive at the time, but export that growth is coming to a close. Some notes on the service sector. In Northeast Asian countries, the share of GDP, industrial of industries is shrinking, service sector is growing, and the countries are headed towards the post-industrialism where Western countries have gone before, a few decades ago. Besides logistics in, in, in uh, logistics and finance in South Korea, uh, key services include design, marketing, entertainment and culture, as in Hollywood, the K-Wave and K-Pop. Um, if we look further and more widely, many services are non tradable <coughs> So the sector as a whole is not dynamic. Productivity remains at, at the stagnant level, the, yet the inflow of labor, because of the re release of labor from industries, is large. So wages are low, these are the met jobs, except in the upper echelons in finance and so forth. This is the worldwide pattern. All countries experience this dilemma, also the United States, Europe, and so forth. With industry winding down as a driver of growth, what is the potential of service specialization for development? In Southeast Asia, we would note that in comparison to Northeast Asia, Urban East Asia still has ways, ways to go, will be a major driver of demand for services. Here, however, education and human capital pose barriers to a higher serv service sector productivity. Let's turn to <coughs> states. And perhaps if previous discussions have been descriptive or empirical, in this section there is a greater emphasis on explanation. Northeast Asian societies show a greater cohesion, and states show a greater continuity over time than those of Southeast Asia. Traditions of confusion, bureaucracy, and meritocracy contribute to the dedication to public service in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China, contribute to the idea of the intelligent state, the educator state, and to developmental state capabilities. So here, arguments of the cynic circle are relevant. For instance, there's a description of the post-Confucian heritage zone in relation to science and higher education, and an observer notes the following four common features. The comprehensive cynic state, Confucian education in the home, an effective response to Western modernization and economic growth, sufficient to pay for educational infrastructure. In, in Southeast Asia, the political cultures have been markedly different. Now, here a little aside, many analyses of Southeast Asian state have been influenced by Weber's idea of, pap of patrimonialism. Weber's idea of patrimonialism has in turn been strongly influenced by European feudalism. We have the feudalism, modernity sequence, and then Association states are viewed as resembling more feudalism or feudal type of modernization, and I think this analysis is the influential. Overlooked a major element. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, uh, uh, let me just add that, uh, uh, quickly finish this. Um, in Northeast Asia, societies have been state centric. If you look at Confucianism, it is a state centric perspective. <coughs> Already in the second century before the common era during the Han Empire, China sidelined 
aristocracy or feudalism. So essentially that was no elite independent of the state. A key role was played by the Confucian bureaucracy, which was established on the basis of competitive written examinations, which go way back in time, but by the time of Seoul, China, were finally honed <coughs> and established. And note that they became established in Europe only in the 19th century. Um, the Association states have been historically fundamentally different from European feudalism. Major states such as Srivijaya, Malacca, and Utya were maritime trading empires in which the rule was based on the control of trade and duties from trade were the main source of revenue. Unlike feudal Europe, they were urban, not uh, rural. Port cities like Palembang, Malacca, Makassar, Aceh, Penang, and so forth, they played a key role. War came into the picture, but they were not uh, organized for a war the way the European castle system was. They have rather more in common with the world of um, the Mediterranean maritime trade, such as the Levant trade of Renaissance Europe. Um, the central task of rulers was balancing competition, rival trade networks, while keeping competitors at bay, um, and conquerors at, at bay. Um, production of cash crops played a part that was linked into the trading net networks. The trading religions of Buddhism and Islam exercised a major influence in the region. And we can paraphrase Anthony King's <coughs> ironical observation. These were postmodern formations, heterogeneous, multicultural, hybrid, outward looking, way before Europe was modern. Now, if you compare that to the Northeast Asian states, uh, and, and, and societies that were very state centric, we could say that the Southeast Asian states were historically different both from feudal Europe and from state centric Northeast uh, Asia. Um, according to the Korean support part, Southeast Asian countries do not have a strong tradition of powerful, capable, indigenous bureaucracy as did the parallel Korea. The state would thus not play a dominant role in national economic development in Southeast Asian nations as it did in Northeast Asia, even if it were willing to do so, for the simple reason that it was less able to do so. Therefore, they relied to a greater extent on market forces to dictate the evolution of their economies. Take a country like Thailand. Quote, Thailand has never had an active industry policy. Thailand's lively and influential business sector operates in what is arguably the most laissez-faire business environment in Asia outside of Hong Kong. Uh, Thailand does not have a national trade negotiating strategy either. Um, that is rather driven by a loose face in the benefits of trade based on a clear idea of the national interest. Contemporary Southeast Asian states have been described as corporate paternalist, neo patrimonial, quasi democratic, soft authoritarian, repressive responsive, or authoritarian but developmentalist, and they combine their hybrids, that combine liberal market uh, economies with patent client relations, the role of strategic groups and business models. The key role of money politics, 
Crony capitalism in the region has of course been extensively discussed. Uh, it is echoed in differences in the corruption perception index between North, East, and Southeast Asia. <coughs> to quote Salabala Muto, Muto and Lo, the Southeast Asian developmental states thrive on KKM, corruption, pollution, and nepotism. This, however, is a contradiction in terms. It is not possible to have a developmental state and KKM because the two institutions, the two agendas, collide. If traditional elites collude with strategic groups through formal political institutions, it does not add up to the kind of state economy and policy competence the developmental state requires. It is, of course, possible to adopt the rhetoric of a developmental state, but it is not possible to deliver the product. So there is a structural mismatch in the region between ambitions and institutions. Here, as everywhere in the world, elites derive legitimacy from their developmental claims and objectives. <coughs> Institutions and policies are out of step with development agendas and Mahathir's administration is a case in point. Now, if we want, if we want to avoid the fall back on culturalist interpretations, for instance, Confucianism were to look at Singapore, we must apply institutional analysis. And in each Southeast Asian country there are different reasons why developed states do not or bad function. That is, ethnocracy in Malaysia, in Thailand, the network monarchy, in the Philippines, landlordism, military rule, and in democracies in Indonesia, Myanmar, and so forth. Um, take Thailand, 0.1% of Thais own half the nation's assets. <coughs> Look at Malaysia. To, there is a relationship between Malaysia and South Africa. Um, an elective affinity, so to speak. Uh, South Africa's BEE, Black Economic Empowerment Policies, has been inspired by, to some extent, modeled after Malaysia's Bumiputra affirmative action policies. But now, Scholars in South Africa, Adam Habib and Bentley, make again a comparison. This is a publication of last year. And now they view Malaysia as a negative lesson. <coughs> they contrast two forms of racial redress, nativist and civic, and discuss Malaysia as a case of nativist red redress, the uplift of Bumiputra Malays through government policies, <coughs> which did uplift the Bumiputra but resulted in higher employment and outmigration brain brain lane of many other groups. And they know the parallels with the policy of black economic empowerment in South Africa, which has a rich state black element. The <coughs> civil Ramaphosa and other uh, folks. And they criticize Malaysia's approach as a negative lesson of re re redress that entrenches ethnic difference. And instead, they advocate civic re redress or the uplift of the disadvantaged regardless of ethnicity. The former approach entrenches ethnic difference, the latter transforms and transcends it as part of the cosmopolitan ethos. Uh, you could note a parallel with the reservations policies in India, 
that sought to change the caste system, but instead institutionalized it, recreating caste and scheduled caste as entitlement categories and voting blocks, while providing benefits to the elite among them, which in India is known rather poetically as the creamy layer. Now, this is media are narrow and they are hard-nosed also. And they simply note that the, the key problem, I quote from the report in the Financial Times, the key problem in, in Malaysia is the one factor business people say holds back in economic development are probably policies. Now, I would say, looking at the literature and the situation, one, the Malays are not a race. And that couldn't be because races do not exist. They are not an ethnic group. <coughs> they are rather a cultural umbrella, a cultural style. Like the Han Chinese, they're not a race. They're not an ethnic group. They're rather an assemblage firstly boundaries of many ethnic groups and um, they are a cultural style. The Blue and Puta affirmative action has been significant early on, but has become functionally autonomous, no longer serves the purposes for which it has been designed, has become a tool in the hands of elites and impervious to, to criticism. UMNO is dedicated to Malay rights, Islam, and the monarchy, and the Sedition Act serves the same purposes. Um, culture matters, but culturalism is a good side. Social heterogeneity matters, but its meanings are socially constructed. Why is that which is enabling in some context, say multiculturalism in Malacca, disabling in other settings? Why are some regions accomplished in dealing with heterogeneity, but not others? Why do some forms of heterogeneity go off smoothly, while others generate lasting friendships? Why do some periods welcome heterogeneity, but not others? Um, <clears throat> if you analyze states and political economies, an important analytic is capitalism. And the key approaches here are, I'm just <coughs> speed up a bit. In the literature, briefly, are the varieties of capitalism approach and more recent approaches. The varieties of capitalism approach is now a little bit old fashioned, very 1990s, a little bit static, but it has contributed <coughs> a tremendously paradigmatic distinction between the liberal market economy, model United States, and the coordinated market economy, model Germany, also Japan. In the coordinated market economy, the state plays a coordinating role, business, labor, social institutions. Uh, the third form, the state-led market economy, examples were France and South Korea, has more or less been <coughs> overtaken by coordinated market, market, market economies. In Northeast Asia, Coordinated market economies predominate. In Southeast Asia, what are the characterizations? Ersatz capitalism, politicized capitalism, party capitalism. <coughs> A hybrid, as mentioned before. Um, now, the key point of this analysis, comparative capitalism, is comparative institutional advantage. Some institutions are beneficial in producing research outcomes, other in research outcomes. However, to political deal-making, there is no institutional advantage whatsoever. Um, we enter a new era, 
we enter an era in the 21st century of globalization with Chinese characteristics. Um, China is large, is plural, <coughs> has features of both South East and North East Asia. It parallels South East Asia in GDP per capita, Human Development Index, Gini Index, rate of urbanization. Um, in South China, the assembly industry is led by foreign direct investment, massive investments by ethnic Chinese, family owned enterprises, also parallel Southeast Asia. Also, China parallels Northeast Asia in agriculture, land reform, productivity, in industry, and in finance and in state institutions. There's a tremendous emphasis on science innovation, tertiary education. 400 universities in Beijing alone, um, strategic emphasis on nanotech, biotech, aerospace, integrated cir circuits, this is, this is the latest of China. And now China's major companies seek to emulate South Korea's cable and go global. In fact, in China, we could say there are three strands of capitalism coexisting, operating at the same time. The state-led market, market economy, the network capitalism of family-owned small and medium enterprises and the clan capitalism of the local government enterprises. Now, the, the Chinese state is polymorphous, is multi-organizational. China faces major contingencies. And China is now in the process is shifting its growth model from export-led growth to investment-led growth uh, possibly the bulk land growth, and it is now exporting its investment land growth uh, model. And of course, if China is plural, heterogeneous, and diverse, so are its outward effects. They involve the state, they involve the security state, local state corporates, and as others. Uh, let me end on this note. Um, top in closing. Yes, there is a pattern of differences between North East and South East Asia in agriculture, in industry, and in state institutions. The two dynamics that have landed South East Asia in the biblical aid are essentially growth and industrialization. And the lead question now, what is the quality of growth? Is it sustainable, inclusive, does it bring well-being? Growth in Southeast Asia was based on commodity exports. In the 1920s, Malaysia was one of the most prosperous uh, developing countries. It was maintained by FDI in industry. But now, of course, let us know there is industry, there is growth and growth, there is industry and industry. In the United States, we make a clear distinction, a radical <coughs> distinction, between industry in the Northeast, now the Rust Belt, for this unionized high wages, and in the South and Southwest, the Sun Belt, growing since the 1980s, flexible production, low wages, low taxes, low services, no unions, which I term Dixie capitalism. We could term this a form of plantation capitalism with industrial technology. <coughs> and most FDI in Southeast Asia uh, is in this category and does not hold much of a future. Finally, then, the 21st century comeback of Oriental globalization opens new horizons. The analysis in this research does have forward policy implications, but these are best spelled out upon further research and refinement and recalculating in the second installment of this research project and in the next part of that lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Yan, for the lecture. Well now, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to hand over the floor to Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Abraham Mbong, 
as the moderator for the question and answer session. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. MC. And thank you, Professor Yan and David Peterson, for the insightful and challenging lecture that he has just presented from Dr. Maslin. Professional Mass Director Jeff Aswar, for the Chairman, for the Foundation Chairman, uh, and friends. Yes, we have had very, we have just had a very enlightening lecture, very encyclopedic on the what happened to the medical aid looking east of the first century. There are many things that uh, Prof. Yen has uh, presented. Um, the leading question was Northeast Asia, GDP per capita high, inequality low, Southeast Asia, GDP per capita low, inequality high, and he expressed many things like medical don't last, and also he emphasized on the approach, the need for long range view or long durée, the need for competitive perspective. Um, competitive capital, capitalisms and so on, and to look, he, he looked into the four sectors that he has mentioned and <coughs> concluded on the point of the state. Now we have roughly about half an hour uh, for Q and A, and look, going by the clock on the wall there, which is ten minutes past or five and a half minutes past, then <coughs> the, uh, five minutes past, right? So we'll end the session, the whole ceremony today, by 12.50 by the clock on the wall, which will be about roughly about 12.05. Okay, I'll take questions, uh, two, three, four, four, two, three questions first, and then we, we, go, as, uh, we go around that way. Okay, I see a hand there. Yes, uh, yeah, please. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kartini. I'm from the Institute of Ethnic Study, UKM. Uh, first of all, Prof. Yan, congratulations for an excellent paper. It is natural for such good invites, comments and criticism. But my main concern is what you've uh, discussed about Malaysia. And I believe that the construction of knowledge about Malaysia is based on two sources. One is English and the other one is Malay language. Your entire description and analysis of Malaysia is based, I believe, entirely in English. Yet we have produced no less than 100 PhD related to the experience of globalization in Bahasa Melayu. Uh, just to uh, lead to your attention, I can see that there are new research based material on Malaysia just published and not available to you, I believe, eh, when you wrote the paper. Because most of the references, I could say, a bit outdated to me. Because uh, just to look back at your comment on native regressive society, yeah, uh, it would be best to look at Andrew Harding's book eh, on the law, government and the constitution of Malaysia that clarifies clearly reasons for Malaysia to impose what he called the positive discrimination, eh, which must be integrated in most policy of development in Malaysia. And the other uh, sources to look at the color of uh, inequality eh, made, uh, uh, recently published by Muhammad Khalid, which is very interesting, uh, reason of why the the unequal distribution of wealth uh, in Malaysia and how he connect the, the consociation of politics that design the way we look at it. So I would definitely defer the idea of looking at us as native regressive. That's my comment. Thank you. Uh, before the end of the I'll take one or two more so that uh, we can bash more together. And I saw one hand. No? You're thinking? Okay, to me. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, I'm only from uh, Fusion Institute UKM. I just want to ask one question. Um, I was recently in Thailand and the tourist guide was quite uh, happily informing us about the AEC that's going to be launched next year. And as we know, several of the Asian uh, ASEAN uh, countries are still under military rule, including Thailand, which is uh, they say temporary, but apparently it's going to be continued until uh, next year. Uh, if you look at the 
speeches given by the current uh, Prime Minister Prayut. So, how is this going to um, um, bring into the research on globalization um, when you factor the uh, influence of the AEC um, in the uh, in the SEA? Thank you. Thank you. One more before Prof. Yen responds. Any takers? Yes, please. Uh, good morning, uh, professors, lecturers, and fellow students. Uh, I'm really interested. Uh, with, with you can up, please. I'm uh, I'm a son. I'm a student from the uh, Faculty of Science, Social, and FSSK. Uh, I'm really interested with your presentation when you mentioned about the relations of Confucianism to uh, the business culture and to the development culture in Northeast uh, Asia. How would you comment with uh, comparing to the uh, experience of the Southeast Asian countries which have in a way more diverse aspect of cultural and uh, religious culture and how does it relate to the developments and globalizations, especially when there's uh, Islam, Buddhism and a lot of other cultures going back to our history. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have had uh, questions and also comments. Um, okay, how about you, Prof. Yen? As to the first question, these discussions, Harding and others, reflect on why the pro bumi affirmative action policies <coughs> originated and became part of of Malaysia's makeup. Um, there are different assessments of how these have affected um, inequality, economic development. The one you mentioned is one of them. But my question to you is this. Yes, if there is there are accounts, reasonable accounts, good accounts of why it originated. In your view, should these policies be continued? Is that smart way forward as part of Malaysia's recalculating? Um, Umi, your question had two abbreviations in it. The, <laughs> the, the AEC and another one, Miss. Can you, uh, uh, can, can you spell out the... the yeah. AEC is the uh, ASEAN uh, Economic Community. Uh, yeah. ASEAN Economic Community. And the other abbreviation is that this has an effect on... Uh, on the SEA, the Southeast Asia um, region. FTA. SEA, Southeast Asia region. There is a regional scrabble for the family combination assemblage of initiatives. There are so many um, that drive the energy, the, the combination. Um, I, I review several of, or I mentioned, I mentioned several of these in the paper. And there are just too many to list now, and they involve many abbreviations. Uh, um, my sense is, thinking about this, um, well, take into account the longer durée, where lies the cohesion the dynamic of, of the region in the context of a thousand, two thousand years. Second, take into account the form of capitalism that these initiatives represent. And there may be a difference actually between the internal, the domestic, and the external. Um, and my, you know, 
I said, European, Northwest European living in the United States, now in Southeast Asia, my sense is that Anglo-American capitalism uh, is much too friendly to corporations. So FDAs um, that rely on this model, when we apply this to renewable energy, to sustainability, to quality of growth, they will be good to the extent that you believe corporations are good for humanity's future, which is wonderful how to the degree, however, that they are controlled by state and civic institutions and not left to um, um, a previous speaker in this room, uh, over there was Mahathir, and after this speech uh, from Raman, some others, they had a conversation with Mahathir, and I asked Mahathir the same question, or a similar question. Were you in Beijing at the APEC meeting, where would you put you away the FDA proposed by the United States, the, the, the Trans-Pacific one, or the one backed by China. And he said, I thought it was so interesting, he said, uh, if you accept a free trade agreement, you are no longer free. Free to protect your own economy. And I thought this was a smart answer. Um, now turning to um, Confucianism and Nazi Asia. Confucianism and Nazi yes, it influences business, surely, but first it influences state institutions, political culture, political institutions. Um, and then the state monitors business. So there are two ways in which it is in, in, influencing business. In Southeast Asia, which is, di which is diverse, with a, a different geographical lo uh, location, um, much greater social and cultural and religious heterogeneity. How does it influence business? Well, but this is precisely one of the questions. At some times, it influences business, it invigorates, inspires business, Sri Vijaya Malaka. And at other times, people, institutions, elites, seek to control it and contain it and put it into boxes, these labels, and then separate the boxes. And then we get uh, a bunkering effect, which is precisely the opposite of the previous era of inspiring and vibrant multi multiculturalism, which was complex. And uh, the Malacca Kingdom balanced many different cultures and trading in interests, trading groups that were engaged in short-term trade, in long-distance trade, and balanced these in smart fashion without imposing one hegemony. So if you want to learn from, from that experience, let us take that in, into account and view multiculturalism as, in business, a driving force. Um, in the 21st century, this is a horizon. It's not necessarily an, an easy one. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Roger. Now we go for the second round. Any further questions or comments from the floor? Yes, from Vienna. Thank you, Prof. Jan, for a very interesting and challenging um, lecture. Interesting because it's an outsider's view of what Southeast Asia is like, and that's always interesting uh, because it may not be the same as an insider's view. Uh, but I'm not asking about that. I know with interest uh, that um, in your analysis of the difference between Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, 
um, you have explained in great detail uh, the differences in the evolution of institu institutions in Northeast Asia as well as institutions in Southeast Asia and how it differs between Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, the different institutional structures and how these institutional structures were, how they have evolved to the point where we are now. Um, so I have two questions on this institutional issue. Uh, the first question is actually to ask you the question that you have posed in your cliff-hanging conclusion that more is to come in the next lecture. Where next is growth going to come from? So can you give us a preview of your idea as to where next you think growth will come from for Southeast Asia? And my, <coughs> that's the preview question. The second question is actually in the context of what you have analyzed on institutions, um, growth would not come from a shift in sectors. You know, where next growth would come from is usually cast in the context as what sectors would support growth, is it? But if we look at your analysis of the problem in Southeast Asia, it would appear to me institutional reform and innovations in institutions are needed for Southeast Asia to move forward. Would you agree to that? And what sort of institutional reform and innovations because we do not we are not necessarily able to copy the institutional structure of Northeast Asia. So, what sort of institutional innovations do we need for Southeast Asia to move forward? Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, there is quite a lot of serious thoughts uh, to answer, um, but very challenging and very important. I take one more. One or two more before I go back to problem. Yes, yes, I uh, Good morning, all. Uh, my question is simple. Uh, my name is Saifu Barika Marudin. I'm a, a writer, journalist, in in-house uh, news portal of uh, this university. My question is: in the recent uh, so-called pro, it, it's not direct related comparison between Northeast Asia and South Asia, but it's about China and. Uh, the perceived power that uh, China projects. Now, in the recent pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong, it had lasted for, I think, even up, up till now, it's not open. Uh, I noticed that the West, especially the United States and uh, the UK and the rest of the uh, European Union, have not commented at all on what was happening with the pro-democracy demonstrations. There was barely any ripple in comparison with with the West's comments on what was happening in uh, Eastern Europe, particularly Ukraine and Russia. What, do you think that uh, China is sufficiently powerful that the West will, would not uh, dare to criticize uh, China in Beijing? Not, a further development is China's projection of power in in the South China Sea. There, there, there is no response to China's uh, claim to the South China Sea. So there is also no comments or criticism from the West on that. So taken together, there it, it seems to show that the West fears China. What do you think of that? Thank you. Okay, one more. on inequality in the more to come lecture. What effect has the work by 
Thomas Piketty, I raised this again for the hundredth time with you. Uh, as the work by Thomas Piketty, <coughs> Capital of the 21st Century, on your own analysis <coughs> on, in, uh, on in, uh, inequity. Because according to Piketty, inequity has never been has never been solved since 1970, uh, since 1789. That inequality is reduced only during war times, and was and Cold War was not even included. In that. So uh, what? Yeah, what? Uh, what would your optimism be based on, so that I can share such optimism? Thank you. Okay, what optimism? As Pak Helen's question, inequality only seems to be reduced during war time. Okay, over to you. Tom, thanks. Very challenging questions. Um, <coughs> my sense is the following, Tom. I'm not, of course, I'm here as an outsider. Of course, my view is different from insider views. Sometimes the, the privilege, the distinguished role of the foreigner is to say that which everybody knows but does not say. Um, I find that so much political energy is devoted to occupied by, almost monopolized by, ethnic questions, which seem actually to recycle positions over and over and over, which totally miss, in my view, where the emphasis should be. And I'm aware that after all, I'm an outsider, it is blasphemous to say so. We should be talking about institutional reform. We should be talking about research and development. How, it's ABC and economics, how do followers become leaders after the following is over? By research and development. But if you talk about ethnicity and balance of ethnicity, you never get there. You never get to that point of institutional reform which should be the top of the agenda. Because institutional reform is, pre is the precondition for the economic uh, uh, reform and the emphasis on science and in, in innovation and research and development. Um, which should include a re-embrace a revaluation, also historically, let Malaysia revalorize the importance of Malacca in Malaysia's history, in the regional history, and as I've tried to indicate, in world his history. This was a really important moment, and cosmopolitanism was crucial to it not a side issue, it was the very driving energy of it. And Malaysia should, in my view, come back to uh, that and weave that into um, its institutional re reforms. Um, the West has been silent on Hong Kong, South China Sea, does the West fear China? Um, well, we are in an era in which the West, you know, there are different components to it, of course, has not been too silent about too many things. It has been rather loud about developments in many neighborhoods. And the interventions that these have involved have not been terribly successful. I'm thinking of the clash of civilizations, what a wonderful idea. And then 
the project of bringing peace and democracy to the Middle East. So I suppose a bit of reflexivity, self-criticism, and restraint on the part of Western actors, although out of character, is not entirely undesirable. <laughs> Just last year in China, uh, <laughs> maybe it does, you know, it has an enormous uh, growing influence of China's dream, Chinese dream, and Asia Pacific dream um, is, um, is momentous. However, uh, say it, it may well be true what you're saying that the West fears China, but if it were the case, this would not be the reason to uh, be silent about this issue. I think it is a rather a matter of um, don't speak too loud about Hong Kong because it may have the opposite re re result. It may create the impression that the Hong Kong demonstrators are there in favor of Western values or American influence and that may be damaging to that effect. Second, the issue of Hong Kong is one. The issue of Taiwan is a much bigger one and because of that China is already practicing a cer certain degree of restraint. South China Sea Outside forces should not be too loud on these issues. Because again, if they were, it would aggravate matters, likely, rather than ameliorate them. Um, I think social inequality is one of our great problems. And, uh, a, a steep, grotesque, and absurd social in inequality is one of the legacies of the 20th century that in the 21st century we are all this. Um, the reason why I emphasize not just different growth, different per capita incomes, because what does it mean after all that I emphasize the GD coefficients, difference in Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia. It, is because I, I, I think inequality is absolutely crucial. Piketty's contribution has been to not just look at income inequality, but at wealth inequality. And this refers to structural reform. To address this requires structural reform. One of the contributions, one of the lessons of Northeast Asia, and we leave aside now why Northeast Asia has uh, done this, these are resource poor regions, unlike Southeast Asia, in parentheses. There are many considerations. The reason why they have such low GD, comparatively GD coefficients, is because of structural reform which does affect wealth uh, in land, uh, in human capital, and so on and so on and so on. And this is very relevant to the question of wealth inequality is relevant on a world scale, not just on, um, on a regional scale. So I think Northeast Asia shows the world and here is a form of capitalism that outcompetes, outshines Anglo-American ca capitalism in fundamental ways. Thank you very much for such interesting questions. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, friends, since we are short of time, it's only 12.10 by the clock on the wall at the back there. We can only afford the six questions and comments from the six participants who have uh, raised the questions and observations just now. And uh, from Gary Peters.
has responded kindly and uh, to the questions. This is not the end of the conversation. It's the beginning. We can pursue further as from again we'll be here till the end of the month and we'll be coming back again uh, in June next year for another so John of about six or seven months. Um, I think I, on, as the moderator for the uh, Q&A session, I would like to express my thanks to Prof. Yen for his lecture and also for the response to the questions from the participants and my thanks to the uh, participants who have kindly raised the questions and comments just now. Now, may I hand over the uh, session to the MC for the next uh, item on the agenda. Thank you very much. Yen.